All right. This is so cool. This is it. Like we're here, right? Like this we're is here. just that's it. Just like oh, so I'm not a live person. I'm not a like go live person. People always like wait. Are we supposed to wait to like build up the audience, or we just start talking? I guess I'll just start talking, and then we'll just we'll just go with it, right? That's what we're doing. Sounds so fun. all right. So hi, welcome. My name is Tennille Jackson. I am the founder of the Chicago Land Mom Squad, and we're trying something new. It's 2022, um, and we have been around for 11 years. So the Chicago Land Mom Squad has been around for 11 years, which is amazing. We celebrated our 11th birthday, December 28th. And one of the things and the goals that we always try to do is just do something different, do something new, and figure out a way that we can build and grow and just continue the mission of the Chicago Land Mom Squad. So with that being said, we decided to come together on a Monday night. We are managing everyone's expectations. We got four good weeks that we're going to give you and then see how you guys like it, listen to your responses. But Monday night mom chats, eight o'clock for the next four weeks starting today. And I've got some awesome guests and awesome people just participating behind the scenes in front of the scenes. So with that being said, we're going to bring in Dr. Femi Skeins with Leadership Edge. Good evening. Uh, very much like Tennille. So this is interesting because uh, Tennille and I have both agreed that uh, that talking is definitely our thing. So, you know, being able to talk to you all um, and, and really not just talk at you all, but to engage in a conversation so that we can continue to strengthen our parenting skills. But I'm not a go live kind of person either. So um, this is a new way of doing what I know how to do. I was the kid that sometimes got checks for talking too much uh, on my report card. So, but now I get to utilize those skills in a way that makes sense. So I am the founder and CEO of Leadership Edge. Leadership Edge is an educational consulting business. And we believe that Leadership is a lifestyle, parenting is the promise, and equity is essential. So this is um, really in alignment with our core values around parenting is the promise. So I am excited uh, to co-host this with Tennille each Monday. We will be bringing on a new guest, and we will have a new topic related to parenting. All right. I think Jerima is next. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm super excited to be here tonight and to be the first guest for these parent talks. Um, my name Yay. is Jerry McCormick. Like I said, I am a mother, first and foremost, of an amazing 10 year old son. I'm also an educator. I've been in education for over 13 years, but um, currently I'm in the role of the founder and executive director for Birth Into Books, which is a community organization centered around literacy. So I'm excited. For this conversation because it involves all the things that i love awesome sauce and i am my name is tony husbands i have been a member of the chicago land mom spot for how long to now it is <laughs> you're 10 years all day i think you started in i should not know nerdy stuff like this but <laughs> she February just told me. well you were added into the group i could see the leaks you know the dates of everybody yes, I so the cool thing about when I started, we didn't have all these tools, but yeah, I got data on everybody now. So I know when you started, who added you, which is really cool. Uh, Femi, you were added in maybe like four years ago. So you technically high key, low key, a newbie in the group. Okay. Who put me on to me? I want to know who are my people. I'll text you the name because I don't know who that is. But I was like, wait a minute. I didn't put I didn't put Dr. Skeins in the group. Wait a minute. Yes. So I do know dates and all that good stuff. Yes. See, I, I was able to jump in. And it's funny because my son is 10 years old. Well, he'll be 10 years old. So I actually found Chicago Land Mom Spot when I was a new mom in Chicago. Okay. And so it's been a wonderful um, experience. And I've had a chance to do some projects with uh, Tennille in the past. And so I'm definitely um, excited to be more on board and to help us kind of bring more of the uh, community that we have in the Chicago Land Mom Squad off of the page and into real life, you know, and that's, that's kind of what these conversations are about is there's, we, there's a lot going on. There's been a lot going on um, in the last couple of months and, and even just this last uh, January, right? And there's a lot of emotions and a lot of things we just need to kind of get off our chest. And so that's what these conversations are going to be about is just giving us a chance. So I want to encourage um, you, the audience, to, again, like uh, Femi, Femi said, it's not a conversation. It's not, we're not talking at you. We, this is a conversation with 
Um, so please participate in the comments. I'm, I'm going to bring, you know, those com comments, conversations, um, questions, anything like that into the conversation. So let's make this interactive. Okay. So, so that being said, our first topic, um, our, our theme for the month is um, thriving, thriving, helping our, helping our families thrive in this uncertain time. And so today we want to talk about like schools back in person. Now what? That's that's our mm -hmm. that's our discussion for tonight. So a lot, again, like I said, a lot going on, and I just want to, who, yeah, I want to know if you all, <laughs> how you all are doing. Just how you all are doing. How you doing with your families, and how are you kind of managing and helping your families like cope with all of the up and down, topsy turvy. turvy. Are we in school? Are we remote? Are we just like ducking our head in the sand? How's everybody doing? All right. So me, I have a seventh grader. So same thing. When I started the group, Reagan was like one, almost two. Uh, so she'll be 13 in February. And we have been remote. So we went through that journey of we went, you know, obviously everybody was down. Then we did the hybrid at the end of last year. Then we came back full, all in, like that's it. And then after this break, same thing. We came in and we went, we were back live and in person. And I was clear. So background for me, I'm in the burbs. I'm in Bolingbrook. Um, love Valley View School District, grew up there, was raised there. I was the one that brought my daughter back to where I grew up because it was my comfort zone. I did spend a little time in CPS, so I get it. Um, but I just, I could not navigate. I didn't get it in from a, just my upbringing in comparison. So right now we are full on in school, but unfortunately, and my daughter's fully vaccinated, but unfortunately, um, my daughter caught COVID. Oh, That's, uh, right? oh I didn't know so, that. Yeah, so we were the ones that went back, following all the protocols, vaccinated, all that good stuff. Got the call last week. Hey, she had came in close contact with mm. someone. But mm. I guess the way the safety protocols are at our school, if you came in full con if you came in close contact but you're fully vaccinated, you're still expected to stay mm. as a student unless you're showing symptoms, which was kind of for me it was like, oh, okay. Right. Don't take her. Okay. And then over the weekend, do all the tests because I am the mom that bought all the tests from Amazon. Wasn't playing. I'm not waiting for y'all. I'm not. I bought all the masks. I, I upgraded masks like I was ready. <laughs> and sure enough, this weekend, just symptoms came. And then when mm. symptoms came, well, I was like, well, let me do another test. Mm -hmm. So now here we are on day two of our five day wait. How's she doing? She's doing fine. She's okay. nasally and all the other stuff. She'll be mad that I told the whole world she got COVID, but <laughs> <laughs> she's doing fine. We're doing yeah. fine. And we're just kind of figuring out, figuring it out. Mm. Yeah. So, um, so our topic, right? School is back in person. Now what? So um, my journey is a little bit different. So um, I am super proud to be a mom in a blended family. So I have two uh, two children that I was blessed enough to birth, uh, one that I was blessed enough to birth in a marriage. Um, and then the newest addition to my family um, is my almost 15 month old godson, right? And so even though, you know, he has a mom and he has actually a very amazing mom, you know, um, he is still very near and dear to our heart as we are just really excited to be part of his village. So, you know, my parenting journey uh, looks a little bit different. And so I have two of my children who are in college and then I have one who's in his senior year. And of course, the baby who just watches Coco Melon. Right. So <laughs> uh, for my uh, for my two who are in college, the school is back in person. Now, what question? That is, I think sometimes we forget about our college age students because when they're sitting home over mm -hmm. winter break, wondering if they are going to be able to go back on campus or not. Sometimes we don't think about how emotionally overwhelming that is um, for 18 or 19 year old. You know, they're, they're loving college. They're living life. Who at 19 years old wants, you know, your thing is like, look, I come home for Christmas. I eat good food and I get back on campus and right. I have my independence. So now it's like, am I going to be stuck at home? You know, part of going away to college is the whole college experience. So the now what for us was throughout the whole break is playing a waiting game to make sure 
that they can go back on college campus and also taking into consideration the impact that that has on our life when my daughter is 12 hours away in oklahoma my son is uh four hours away in michigan so now we're like juggling two career schedules and who's getting them off to college so yeah sometimes we forget about the college age uh kids and then my son is like okay senior year am i gonna mm, miss my senior yeah. activities are we gonna have in-person graduation so being back in it, it's still that fit that angst of like back in for how long and what does this mean for me yeah and i can go uh, my son like i said he's 10 and we he actually attends a private school but with my work i work within the school so that has been just a very interesting dynamic of seeing how his school handled you know different if like someone was caught with COVID or was like you know a classroom but yet the school didn't close but then also working within cps and other like charter or private schools and just seeing the different protocols that people decided to do i would say my son his biggest thing is i'm just ready to just have normal school <laughs> like my yeah. my son is super active he swims he plays basketball um and just to have like games canceled or you know not opportunities to be around his friends has been like the major thing for him but it's also mixed with this i don't want to get sick right and so mm -hmm. that's been a very interesting conversation because even coming at the winter break he could have went remote um they gave him that choice to do remote or come in and he was like i just want to stay home for a little bit but then he missed his friends so he went back the following week so it's just been i think for many of our kids they understand the severity of it but they also want community right so just that struggle of how do you have community when you know it may not be the wisest decision at certain times right you right. know what jarima if i can kick in just a little bit around that whole conversation of you like so your your son had the option you know to go remote coming back off winter break i think um one of the things that i know parents are really struggling with is this whole idea of school is back in person but what happens if a class has to get flipped or what happens if a class has to quarantine mm -hmm. parents are still feeling the stress of what if i don't have a village or what if I actually have a village, but I have parents who are ailing and they're not willing to take on a kid who's been exposed to COVID. So parents are feeling this frustration of like they can't get any stability in their life right now because they're always on angst, like hoping that it's not their child's class that has to get flipped because they their kid has been exposed to COVID. I think that the feelings of, um, what's the word? The restlessness that parents are feeling, like how is this going to have an impact on on my personal life or my career all of that it's it's real yeah, yeah. there's a um there's a term um pandemic exhaustion that a lot Ooh. of us are dealing with i learned that from my, um I, my therapist <laughs> because i'm dealing with it myself right <laughs> as a therapist now <laughs> share all of you share all of with us every that's day. what it is that's what i have <laughs> and seriously and and it was it was kind of like you know i actually I actually had to, um, I actually had to pull out, pull my kids out of school um, totally because I just knew, like mentally, I couldn't handle the, the, the anxiety and the, the not knowing whether or not you know what's going to happen, you know what's going to, what are they going to be exposed to? At the time, you know, we didn't know anything about it. My son has severe allergies, and you know, we didn't know if like you know those things would would be some kind of factor, and so. I know, and and Tanil is good about this. Check your privilege, right? Um, and reminding us to check our privilege. And I realized that that not everybody has that option yeah. to 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 um, to make that choice. I left my job because I wasn't able to handle the the remote and the and the um, and the homeschooling and stuff like that. So I I did leave my job um, to manage that. But for me, even going through, even being able to kind of insulate myself in that way there is still a a very real um like mental um weight i think that i still deal with you know because it's just like every little decision you make even like over thanksgiving it's just like do we go see the family because we haven't seen anybody in like two years and i miss people and, I, and i'm like the, i'm that like textbook extrovert you know like i get my energy from being around people that's why i love that we're doing this because <laughs> like you know it's yep. just like it gives us a chance to like connect and and um swap energies and just kind of like vibe off one another but but um pan that pandemic exhaustion that a lot of us are just like um 
you know, carrying around, you don't even know we can, you know, you don't even know just how much that that impacts like your just uh, level of joy. I'll just put it that way, you know, and it's, it's, it is, it's very real, something to, to recognize and to make sure that if you're like, um, that you seek help, you know, that you seek and it's, there's no, and there's no shame about that. You know, there's no shame about seeking help if you're like to a point where you can't get yourself, you know, over that hump. And I think, I think you hit on something with pandemic exhaustion, but it's one of those things where sometimes, you know, it's like when you're exhausted, you can rest in the end, you know, there's an end. We don't know. I don't see an end. And <laughs> I was even thinking about, literally, because I think I told you guys this story about, I'm, I went, I'm like, okay, you come pick up my kid. No problem. Oh, wait, she's got to stay. And then it's that if I didn't work from home, if I didn't own my own business, if I didn't do all that, yeah. how does that work? Where am mm -hmm. I planning? Mm -hmm. it, it, there is no, there, there is no plan. And then you, you say, okay, let's plan for, what am I planning for? You know? And I think what we have now are each other, right? We've got right. these groups, right. we've got learning lessons. I think that we're past the hump, or at least I, I, I hope we're past the part where we're not embarrassed to say when someone has COVID, right? That's a, that's a thing. And I think that mm -hmm. that's a thing that impacts how we function, how we operate, whether or not I'm gonna send my kid to school or not. They ain't coughing too bad. Now, hold on. The cough is a cough is a cough. Right. Type of thing. And even as a parent, I always tell people, I'm the parent that you do have to call 10 times. I need the reminders. I need the, because the reason I got the call the first time was because I forgot to tell them she was vaccinated because, i.e., I forgot to drop the card off, i.e., oh, you right. don't know, I don't right. know. I'm not all, always on top of it. So what does that look like as it relates to everybody and what questions? And I'm hoping that with what we're doing, it opens the eyes. We start sharing a little bit more mm -hmm. on, hey, I did this. Oh, we yeah. did a five piece. We did a 10 piece quarantine. You know, this is how this works just to kind of help us all figure it all out as it relates to that. But I'm I'm more interested in what from even Femi with you, what are you expecting of us as parents? So you you are a principal, but what are what's the expectation or what should be the, and, and same with you, Dreama, what should be the expectation of parents proactively like what is it that we're expected of that should be expected of us so one thing um i want to really tap on you know when we talk about the word embarrassment right like we have to get past this thing of being embarrassed um because somebody has been exposed to COVID, and you know like i tell my teens all the time uh, COVID is not an STD. So it's not like, oh, I've made some mistake. And so now I have to walk around, you know, with the scarlet letter and nobody can know because this is really a public health emergency. So we need to actually be more forthcoming so that we can really be our brother's keeper. So that I think it's really demystifying the, the plague language that we have used. And, and in my opinion, that's, it's actually led to the spread because people didn't want to be ashamed and embarrassed to say oh i have covid right so that mm -hmm. that's one part of it but i think that there's another kind of shaming that as moms we need to talk about and that's the shaming that has happened so our topic again is school is back in session moms have different opinions i might be a mom that i'm like listen uh my child needs to be back in school but then whether it's a family member, whether it's with, even within our own Chicago Land Mom Squad, then somebody else is like, how would you put your kid back in school? And somebody mm -hmm. else might say, hey, I want to be remote. And then somebody else is like, you want to be remote? Your kid's emotional development is going to be a mistake. Mm -hmm. So you have all of these different opinions that are clashing. And I think that it is actually causing more of the pandemic pandemic exhaustion and fatigue mm -hmm. because there's nothing like feeling judged as a mom. We don't talk about it, but that's very real. Like nobody wants to feel like I'm not a good mother. And so for every decision that you make, then you have another mom that's like, what a counter opinion. I think we got to chill with one another. People have okay. to make the decisions that are best for them, their house and their family without placing judgment on, on another family or another mom for making the decisions that are right. So I think what parents have to do um, is a parents have to be more responsible and more accountable. We just can't send sick kids to school. I know that it might have an impact on your family. I know it might even have an impact on your money and your bottom line. But we have to be responsible as parents to say they don't feel well. I have to do something else. That's the first thing. The second thing is I beg and I plead and I beg and I plead that we 
we have to be more in charge of the communication. A lot of times as parents were like, oh, the school needs to communicate more. Well, listen, I'm, I'm here representing Leadership Edge, so I can say whatever I choose to say tonight. <laughs> Schools actually communicate well in a lot of a lot of cases. Parents don't read. Parents don't. Don't be judging me. You just said we're not judging. Now we judging. I'm judging. So I might see later. <laughs> and the thing is, like th this is not the days of you're not getting a one on one call in a right. in an age where information is just coming out like so so fast. Parents have to at least know the school's rhythm and you have to be in charge of reading and being informed. Nobody's going to keep you informed about your kid. And so, you know what, Neil, I get it. Right. Because like I got a bunch of kids, so I get having to read a lot. I tell parents this. You might not be able to read every email that comes out when it comes out, but set an alert to say I need to go back and I need to make that part of even if I just sit 10 or 15 minutes on my calendar to say I need to make sure that I'm checking in to see what information the school is giving me. Because, mm -hmm. hey, don't be mad and say they don't communicate when the truth is you didn't read. Now, I said it. The people could be mad. I said the parents don't read. <laughs> so, I think we should just own the part where there are parents in this world that might need the text, the email, the remind app. I might need you it. You gotta all. read those though. I'll read it when I get ready. <laughs> <laughs> Jerima, what about for you? What's your what's your what's your are you a instant responder mom? Like what's your deal? <laughs> like, do you they gotta tell you a couple times? You know what? I wanna say. Again, back to a comment that Tony said earlier, I understand I have the privilege of having that time to be able to do that. And it's just kind of my personality to be like, I need to know what's going on. So I am like the instant person. Um, but to your point of like, what do parents need to be thinking about? The thing that I keep telling like the families that I work with, what, what our, most, our most top priority should be our children's well-being. Mm -hmm. And that's top. And that's for me talking as an educator, as a parent, I've done it all. I just feel like at this point with the way our kids are feeling physically, emotionally, and just so psychologically is what's most important right now. And I, and I, a lot of times when we're trying to figure out how do we best support kids, I believe that our kids need to feel like they are being heard. Right. And they need to be feeling as if they have a safe space to say, Ma, I actually don't want to go to school and not because I don't want to learn, but just, I just right now can't take it right now. Um, I feel like as parents, again, like you said, that whole point in the blame, we know what's best for our kids, you know? Um, and I think that that's the part that I don't want us to lose is just this awareness of like loving up on our babies. Like I, I really look at our kids as like our babies, like my son, you know, one day, like I could just tell he was exhausted and I didn't take him to school that day. Like, I'm not going to be judged for that. I felt what was best for my son that day mm -hmm. is that he stayed home and went to sleep. And guess what? He didn't even know I was going to do that. I woke up that morning mm -hmm. like, I'm just going to let him sleep. And he woke up and was like, thank you, Ma. You know what I mean? Like, thank you. Because, again, grades matter to me. All those things matter to me. But him being his best self is what's priority for me. So I think that I love that we have this community to talk because we need to be able to share what can we do to really help our kids be their best selves? And I know this whole discussion about learning loss and all these different things is a real thing. But I also am from the camp that our babies can learn it. it it's not going to be detrimental if they don't learn how to reduce fractions in February. Like it's go, they're going to be okay. Can I ask? Like, they, they'll be okay. They don't have to be, you know, forced to have to learn these things if they're not even the mental capacity to even take that information in. Can I ask the educators, because that's actually a question I have, is should we be concerned as parents with this idea of learning loss? Is it that big of a deal if, you know, if our kids from a pandemic perspective have to maybe repeat a grade? Is 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 that is that something that we should be they're like? They're not even going to have to repeat. I, I, you, they're not going to have to repeat. Uh, well, well, let me let me share. Let me share. Somebody posted a um, uh, an article about a lady. It was a good article about, a I mean, an interesting article about a lady in New York who's suing the, the okay. New York um, public school system because of all of the learning loss of her child because they didn't have the internet access and working machines and blah, blah, blah. And it's, a, it's a group. It's a class action, I guess. And in um, this lady's particular case, she has to, her child has to repeat the seventh grade 
right? And I was just like, I'm, and I, I understand like the, I understand that that's not our plan, you know, but to me, this virus is, is, is um, upending all of our plans, basically. And I'm just wondering if we should be so concerned about like sticking to, you know, sticking to a, a, a timeline that's not necessarily in line with what we're dealing with right now. No, we shouldn't. I'm more interested in Femi's response that they're not going to have to repeat. Yes. I think and ex further <laughs> further explain but i'm con i'm more concerned about let's all just let's let's keep it extra real like if we miss a few things and now if i talk about like kindergartners or first graders and my heart yeah. goes out to everybody with primary babies let me just keep it real i got a very responsible seventh grader who yes they, she will read the emails for me and be like mom mom <laughs> <I'm not laughs> <nervous laughs> <minders too." laughs> but I, my heart goes out to the to the, the k2s right right, the, right. The k5s like you guys are like that's a whole they're your kindergarten mom i don't feel like going to school today mom I'm trying to you know we're about to have some fun but i'm more concerned about what if they aren't on target what is the educational system doing to make sure that you know once we start putting our children in bigger pots that they're actually ready despite the numerical grade of seventh right. grade eighth right. grade what does that look like so a couple of things um with that so uh before we go back three things real quick the first thing is i just dropped a link in um i actually uh wrote an article that was published in cranes maybe back in august where i talk about uh you know uh where i talk about drop, learning law you better name drop you better article drop you know just a little link uh <laughs> But no, what I actually talk about learning loss. So, you mm -hmm. know, people can uh, read a little bit more about my deeper perspective around it. That's the first thing. The okay. second thing cool. is, you know, I love this, uh, Tanil, because some people going to either like or love me. You know, I, I'm no no in between kind of person, <laughs> right? At all. So, I'm, I'm really not. You either like me or you love me. Uh, I mean, you like me, you, you don't like me. <laughs> but here's the thing I, I read a comment, and then Tanil, you just said it. I'm going to tell you something I disagree with, and I'll tell you why I disagree disagree with it. This concept of the kid read the email and explain the child is not in charge of parenting themselves. That's why you are the parent. So they have enough to be responsible for. Like at, at what point I, I know that I know we're busy. All right. I get it because I have three different sets of communication from three different schools. And that's before I check in with the guy says mother. But we have to stop making them more responsible for things that kids should not be responsible for. They are children. And so whether we want to believe it or not, they are suffering from exhaustion and them trying to tell you or, and you got to remember that school communications are typically written for a higher audience. So a kid may not completely understand and be able to navigate what the school is asking them to do is your email. No, I just said it. The last thing is this gap, right? Like that was New York. And I, I mean, that could happen. But I can tell you all as a parent advocate, mm -hmm. if a school is making your child repeat because of a loss of skill, then that's a bigger conversation. Um, most of the time, to be honest, uh, the kids that I see who are truly, truly failing right now, like getting F's are kids who are completely disengaged from school, like completely disengaged from school, right? Like they're not coming. So the teacher has nothing to actually assess them on. But if a kid is going to school, even 80, 70% of the time, the chance of them failing right now um, is almost slim to none. Because here's the other thing. It's not just kids who are out. Teachers are out. Teachers are sick. So like, hey, my kid gets a low grade and the teacher has been out a lot. Now we got some different conversations. I just think that we should not be so overly concerned about being standards based as mm -hmm. kids have to navigate a pandemic. Like I need them to be whole people and we yeah. can, we can tighten up the learning. I don't even believe in the phrase learning loss. Nope. I, because those are standards that we have created. So the pandemic then says that we actually probably should be adjusting our standards. And this is going to actually be a multi-year impact. So right, I go on right. no, I ain't no learning yeah. loss. They learn some different stuff. They learn how to cook. They learn how to be more empathetic. They learn stuff off TikTok. They learned it differently. True. Very true. And I would say, Tony, to that, like, 
and again, this might be a love it, like and a love it uh, comment as well. <laughs> I I think at the end of the day, standardized testing, the benchmark that they're using to determine whether or not you're on grade level is it should have been wiped out anyway, right? So this whole why? idea that why do you say that? So why do I say that? So when we think about like a test determining the wealth of knowledge a child learned in a whole school year, like it cannot be assessed in one sitting time, right? So you had kids who are freaking out, right? Because if I don't pass this test, I'm going to have to go to summer school. Not taking into account like the projects and presentations and even their learning styles and all those different things that should be put into account whether or not a kid mastered the skills. So mm-hmm. at the end of the day, having so much weighted on a child and whether they're going to advance is uh-huh. really the right period. You know what I mean? But I think at the end of the day, it's, it calls to a bigger issue, which is like the restructuring of the educational system, period, right? Because at the end of the day, as a teacher, that's what I'm held to. I'm held to yeah. if my kids hit this benchmark, are we advancing? Are we at level one, level two, level, you know, all these different things. So I think at the end of the day, kind of what Phoenix said, like you got, you got to think about it. if your kid is a second grader right now, they have not been in school. So they missed a whole community building independent stuff you learn in kindergarten. They missed that whole thing in first grade. And now they're in second grade. But cognitively, they are still in kindergarten. They're a kindergartner that's in a second grade classroom, yet you still want to hold them to a second grade standard. But they still haven't even mastered technically first and kindergarten standards. You know, mm. first and second, you know, those things. So it's just like the whole idea of like what when and what you're supposed to know. Like, yes, they need to know those skills. But back to what she said, I think that there's some other things that are priorities. And even when we were in school, people was, you know, upset about the way we were assessing kids. And it wasn't right then. So it's not why go back to something we weren't happy about even before the pandemic. Like it should just be an opportunity for us to think about new ways to see if kids are understanding. So with that in mind, oh I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Mm -mm. I was just with that in mind, I'm wondering from the panel, um, and I don't know if you guys just saw the 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 comment I just popped up there of the mom, she was uh she said she had three diverse learners and she's very super stressed. With that in mind, and I just wanted to know what you guys thought were would be some tips for parents to help their children cope and even to kind of cope with all this uncertainty, you know, with, with these changes in the educational level. So if they're not getting those developmental school um, skills, if they're, if they're missing out on those de- developmental skills, what are some ways we can help as parents, our kids kind of cope and still thrive in this you know, season of uncertainty? I- Besides reading our emails, which I mean, I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna say I'm a city on the attitude. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about that part. Um, besides reading the emails and make sure we all know, and we can stop reading the emails. Um, I think it starts with the part, and I know you, the educators are gonna give the fancy answer. I'm gonna get it to Neil, who don't turn in stuff. Answer, I think we have got to like. I'm so excited we're doing this. I'm reading all the comments and I yeah. know we'll we'll chime in on that. I think we have to start just it starts with practicing grace on ourselves. I think Tony, you actually kicked this this off properly. You started off with a whoo, <laughs> right? And I think that it's there. We don't get to have a frame of reference anymore for how it was when we were growing up. We don't get to mm-hmm. we don't get to do that. Like we have to do the, you know what? Let's go bake cookies today and if I could slide in some fraction lessons or not. I'm going to do that. But I think that one of the things that we have to do and we have to prioritize is making sure that our children are okay first. So if that means we're prioritizing, you know, it's it's that reevaluating how we're parenting, you know, am I the tough mom or am I kind of like, you know what, my baby doesn't respond to all this yelling. We've been in the house all day. What does that look like? So that's kind of my answer is really prioritizing. Yes, education is important. That is the focus and the theme for the next four weeks. Our children need to be smart. They need to learn. But I think that we've got to really come together Monday nights at eight o'clock every Monday night at eight o'clock here on this broadcast, really just to reflect and, and bounce things off. And I think that as parents, we don't, we don't talk enough to each other. I think we talk about a lot of times with how it is with the kids and making sure that they're isolated. Some of us are still a little awkward. Mm-hmm. We, we suffer from awkwardness. It sometimes it comes out in the post. Mm-hmm. Um, let's keep it real. <laughs> <laughs> you know, find a friend. So uh-huh. that's my, 
Tanil don't read emails, responds. And <laughs> first of all, I'd also like to take a quick minute because I am reading the comments and I know we're doing that at the end, doing it towards the end. No, but shout out to the dads. No, shout out to the dads tuned in. So I see Jim Allen and I see yeah. self. Um, so <laughs> thankful that this can be a combined conversation where we're, you know, you get a little piece of the mom squad and kind of how we are on a regular basis. So that's my so answer. I'm all about parent advocacy, right? One of the things that I really like to do, um, as I like to take my experience as a public school educator for the last a lot of years. Um, you know, I've been a school administrator for the last 11 years, been in education almost 20 years. And so I like to take what I know about running the public school to help parents understand how to advocate and navigate a public school. So here's the first problem. And it is a problem. And if the problem rests with the schools, it's most of the times, most of our schools don't communicate consistently, right? So it's it's a vagueness around the rhythm for communication. So what am I saying? Parents, we have a responsibility to hold schools accountable for consistent communication with us. My families yeah. know that they should expect to hear from me, though I haven't sent it this weekend, but that's because I had to inundate them with info last week, and I, which I try not to do. But I try to only communicate with my parents on well Sunday, unless it's we're off on a Monday, and then it's on Monday. It's the day before the week starts, right? That is the rhythm. That is when parents know that they can expect to hear from me. Parents, you have to say to your school, what, when can I expect to hear from you. How can I expect to hear from you? I guarantee you for a school that's all over the place with communication, that question alone will make them tighten it up. That's why sometimes, honestly, Tanil, I'm teasing you. That's why it's yeah. hard for us to keep up with the emails because the emails are all over the place because schools are communicating too sporadically. You have to say like, listen, communicate with me consistently and then I'll know, hey, look for it on Sunday or look for it on Monday or whatever the day of the week is. That That's one thing. Um, here's something else that we have to do as a parent village. We have to stop talking about each other and we have to get back yeah. talking to each other yeah. and that's what we lost the village nobody wants to be talked about nobody wants to be judged right we can sit in the same space and we can have different ways of doing it but i don't need you to talk about me i need you to talk to me and even if i'm making a mistake um help me through it and i use this as an example sometimes i hear in a mom squad people are like i wouldn't say anything i probably would i remember at a gas station one time I saw a young mom do something that was going to be dangerous for her baby. And I said, sweetheart, let me talk to you for a second. I said, listen, I'm not judging you. I got, you know, three kids of my own. I'm telling you this as an experienced mom. Let me tell you something. What you're doing is dangerous for your baby. I'm going to tell you why. It's no judgment, sweetheart. Just don't do that again. We want to keep your baby safe. Now, my inclination was she probably snaps on people a lot. Just, you know, kind of the vibe I got from her. I'm waiting for this. I'm waiting for that. <laughs> she me on my head. <laughs> but she didn't do any of that mm -hmm. because I didn't judge her, right? It was a conversation. We just got to get back to not judging each other on our parenting. Yep. The thing yep. I would say is, like you just said, like, you know, being an educator, we have, and a lot of times in these situations, like, well, I'm going to have my child do this in the interim while school is figuring it out. And one of my friends, we were having a conversation. She's like, man, you know, us who are not parents, who are not educated, uh, who's a parent but not educators, we're not just going to automatically, like she was asking me something Trey was doing. And I was like, oh, I haven't read this book. And I was she's like, what's the name of that book? Like, what are you doing? You know, like asking questions. Again, not judging, but knowing that that's a skill and something that I already normally do. I think in this mom squad group and in other groups, we just need to put together our collective genius. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that we have educators that's on this line. And if my son is in fifth grade, I bunch of, I'm sure there's a bunch of moms in here who have fifth graders, like those who are educators, that's that's put together like virtual things for our kids to do. Or, you know, like, hey, I'm, I'm a math teacher. If your child needs help on so and so, like offering those kind of services versus being like, what do you mean your, ch your child is turning to work? Like, well, maybe the parents didn't know how to help their child break it down. But if we collectively are like, hey, I'm offering free math support. You know what I mean? I, and I saw a few 
posts that were that were doing that. Like I saw a few posts in my personal page. I was like, hey, I'm a reading teacher. If your child needs help with so and so, just let me know. I think those kind of posts allow a parent to be like, you know what, I'm glad you offer because I don't know. I want him to do it, but I just need that support. So I think just us thinking about how can we come together with our collective genius. And then secondly, knowing that learning is all around us, you know, uh just even recently, you know, they have the documentary of women of the movement, right? About Emmett Till, like having your kids like sit down and watch those kind of documentaries or different things. They're learning history. They're learning about themselves. They're learning about, you know, things that they will possibly depend on the school learning school. But I think having those kind of teachable moments as well, it may not be in a textbook. It may not be a book report they're going to do, but they're still learning. So I think, like you said, if I'm cooking, we're going to fit it in where we can. If not, we just having a bonding moment. And what I don't know, I should feel safe enough to put in mom squad. Hey, y'all, I got three kids. I am completely lost. Who in here can support me? And we yeah. should be able to come and wrap our arms around with no judgment and say, you know what? I'll get on Zoom real quick with your baby. Just, just tell me how you need me to help. So I think we need to do more of that versus pointing the fingers when parents aren't doing certain things. Yep. And I think this is a great time to uh, talk about how awesome and consistent Burst Into Books has been this entire uh, pandemic. Woo, woo. Are you ain't missing email? First of all, I'm the, I'll, I'll read those emails. I struggle, I, struggle <laughs> in, I struggle in my real life. I'm being as honest with the internet. I struggle. Man, Jarema, it'll be week one, pandemic week two. I was good for like three weeks. Jarema was like, week 25? I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. But you have amazing programs virtually for our children in that area of reading and doing all that stuff. So I just appreciate you in general for all that you have done during the pandemic to just help in general. Thank you. Well, first of all, because Jerema is amazing. Oh, she sure is. is about, you know what I mean? I, I think it's about us being able to use what we have to help each other, you know, and I think that um, whatever piece of that pie that I could play, I want to play it and support mm -hmm. others that are doing it as well. So um, I appreciate you all. So here's, so going back to Tony's original question, what can families do? And so um, we're going to stray away from the term learning loss. In fact, like, let's just have a ceremony. We're going to bury this concept of learning loss. Okay. Our kids have not, they haven't lost their learning. They've, they've changed the path in which they need to learn. Um, and and they're, we're changing the path for how they learn. There's one thing that all parents can do. It's not a matter of skill. It's a matter of discipline. There's one thing um, that I find that kids struggle with. And I don't even honestly think schools do it well. And it's the lost art of writing. So if you want to do something to help your kids get back. In fact, um, so and Jerima and I have done some literacy things together. I'm actually a reading specialist by trade. Like before I, you know, when this little admin thing, uh, I am a reading specialist. The research says that if you had to make a decision about um, like if you only had so much time and you either had to do reading or you had to do writing, most people will say, oh, we're going to spend time reading. Well, reading, you only read. But if you spend time writing, it makes you read and write. Right. So because you can't write without reading, but you can read without writing. Yep. Kids, get your kids a journal. I don't care if they're in first grade and they're writing letters that are like this big or I don't care, you know, if they are in high school. We have to get back to doing something where they write every day. That can look different in your house. It could be help me make the grocery list. It could be today is, um, you know, we're off school for MLK Day. I don't believe in just sitting around like whatever day that we're off for in my house. We always acknowledge that day. It could be get on that phone that I pay a lot of money for. Write me three facts about MLK. Write me a paragraph about what you learned and let's just talk about it at dinner. We have to find ways to get our kids back writing. You could put a journal in your car in the back seat in that little pocket that collects trash and you tell the kids while you're in the car, I want you to, to tell me... Uh, the best part of your day. But before you tell me, write it. If you get back to your kids writing every day, you will see their skills go through the roof and it creates a safe space. You can tell them to write. Tell me something I did that made you angry. They may be able to write it. And when they can write it, then they can tell you. But it's going to be hard for them to just tell you writing every day. Here's something I and I'm glad you, I'm glad you brought that up. Here's, here's something that I've been doing with my kids that is definitely... 
um, encourage them to write. And I wouldn't say I did it because they it's probably their idea, but I've seen the benefit of this. They actually write and we turn what they write into movies. OK, yeah. and I'm not I'm not talking Steven Spielberg. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, I'm talking your iPhone or your Android phone and 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 a little editing program, you know, that comes standard on any laptop, basically, and put it and throw it up on YouTube. And we did that um, with the first one. And actually, this is something and I'll probably talk a little bit more about this later on. But it's something that I think that can encourage kids just in general to tap into their creativity because these kids are amazingly amazing amazingly <laughs> imaginative and to see them like go through that process and and then build something that they can actually like oh i i did that you know i did that and, and be you know get a look because of course grandma grandma and grandpa are gonna be like oh my baby made a movie you know and so like the idea of taking their stories like they're playing anyway they're playing or they're imagining stuff, have them write that down and then actually, you know, take one or two of them and 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 maybe that's something we'll talk about a little bit later about just how simple that has been. And maybe we could even have like a mom squad, you know, um, film festival or something like that. I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tony Hill with all the ideas right now. We need to focus on Family Feud though. Let's just get it there. So, <laughs> been made. Been right. Made. It has been moved. Yeah. That's it. I, I got it. <laughs> but yeah, just, just just an idea about you know just different ways to encourage kids to do to read that those skills reading and writing that lead to them creating something concrete and plus as a mom I love it because I'm gonna have something you know that my kids did when they were eight you know seven to eight years old as they grow up and if they have girlfriends and boyfriends I'll be like come here y'all watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I want to add to that because Tony, first of all, she's being really humble. The, the the movie her her child made is amazing, so I'm 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 excited for this movie festival. But us using like what our kids are into to get get them engaged into learning as well. So uh, recently, I'm I'm not a huge social media person. Like I do it because of my bit. Stop looking at me like that, to them. But I'm not like I I, I master the platform. So like Facebook. Instagram, but like TikTok, all that. I'm not doing all that. It's just too much to try to learn. So my son, though, I is really that. into that, right? He's really into watching the videos. And so I said, you know what? I'm about to hire you. So I hired my son to do my TikTok stuff. So like we'll watch it. And of course, it's under Versus to Books account. He don't have his own. Yeah. But in what I what I pushed him to do, because I have him read, I was like, I want you to do videos. But like one of the videos, I want you to be a book review. So instead of you writing, I want you to do like a, a mini mm. book review. He did a whole video, why he gave it a nine out of 10, why he mm. gave it this and that. And mm. so it was like still him doing a book report, but like using this platform where he's not doing all the TikTok dances, but he did use some of the sounds for some of them. So I think us integrating yeah. some of the things that they're doing. Like, yes, traditional writing is necessary. Please, please, please have your babies write because when they go to college, that's the one skill that they're going to have to do continuously. And many of them end up in writing centers like myself. I'm a product because of me not being pushed a lot to write. And so that's why I'm so big about reading and writing. But I think that we also can use what they're already into. It's like, oh, you over there making that TikTok dance. Why don't you make a dance about you know, da, 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 da. and I mean, and they're going to be in, entertained and want to do it, but they're also showing you what they learned. So mm -hmm. just being creative and how we can not try to get them off certain platforms, but use it as a tool to help them in school. Right. So it. ladies, um, this as we, right. As, <laughs> as we thought, you know, there's so, there's so much to, to talk about. There's so many, um, you know, so much to, to engage with. And I do hope that this is something that, um, that our community finds helpful and that we can continue to, to do. And we can continue to like reach into the mom squad for more guest hosts. Um, Jarima, thank you so much for um, for agreeing to to jump on this inaugural inaugural yes. uh, broadcast with us. This has been great. Before we hey, wait, up, tell me, what better way to have the kickoff of this conversation, which is about community, it's about our people, um, mm -hmm. than on Martin Luther King's birthday? I think that that's an important call out. Um, I remember reading the book in high school, Why We Can't Wait by Martin Luther King, and mm -hmm. it, it literally changed my way of thinking. And it just brought to my mind now, like, why we can't wait to have these conversations, why yeah. we can't yeah. wait to save our babies, why we can't wait yeah. to engage in community. And so I think that today, 
is the perfect day um, to be having this conversation because listen, this idea, and we're going to talk about privilege in a couple of weeks. I'm writing that down uh, because I agree with Neil about checking our privilege. We cannot sit around and say, oh, those are those kids. Those are not my kids. Well, those are the same kids that your kids have to live in community with. So you think you can forget about them if you want to, and you still going to pay for it. So this is about us being a village. And so I think that this day is a great day to have this conversation. Amen. Well said. Well said. Yeah. So I don't know, Jarima, is there anything you want to share with the, you know, we've been kind of discussing first in books, but if there's anything specific you wanted to share with the group uh, before we got out of here about what's going on with first in books? Yeah. So coming? we are excited for Black History Month. I'm so excited about um, some programs we had. We are having, uh, we had, we had it in person. We shifted just because we just thought it was the best decision. But I think this is a way to uh, why in our audience? So we have for every week in the month of February, we're doing an event that's centered around the Black history of Chicago, not just Black history, period. So we're kicking it off on February 5th with uh, Dilla, the urban historian. I don't know if you know him or familiar with him, mm -hmm. but he is... Um, someone who has changed the game so when i talk about TikTok, he's been using TikTok as a way of sharing the history of chicago and so him along with the founder of urban intellectuals who created like the black history mm. facts and cards yeah. they're going to do a panel discussion on february 5th it is all of these are virtual through zoom private events and they're free and so we have giveaways for each of the events so that's february the 5th on february the 12th i have an amazing um singer who has wrote a whole album about women of black history and so our giveaway for that would be her her um, merchandise and her songs on february the 18th we're doing a family craft night so if you're crafty we'll have like what you need to bring to do that craft and then we're going to end out the month just giving a bunch of different giveaways so if you go to versus to books there's a back a back um black history tab and you can register for all of those events. Awesome, awesome. You are awesome. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody else has anything they want to I do. Uh, I go do. Ahead. I got one. You know, I'm gonna go with Tanil. You you bring us home. You do such okay. a like you have been a dick. Well, <laughs> so uh <laughs> so along with um actually I'm I'm going to have all of the information within another week, 10 days, somewhere in there. But I'm um, kind of along the same lines with Black History Month and, and my passion about getting students to write. I'm still narrowing down which uh, age focus. But um, so Leadership Edge, again, that's my consulting arm of it. But um, I also have a non for profit in honor of my father, who he was uh, Black History Chicago. Right. And so his. Um, my non for profit is uh, Dr. Warrell's World. And so it's really focused on educational development and post-secondary readiness for young people. So I am going to have a Black History launch that we're doing. Um, and, and, and actually right now, um, I'm still planning for it to be face-to-face. -face. So it's it's a non for profit but it will be hosted uh, at my brick and mortar building on Leadership Edge. And so stay tuned because we are going to have a Black History contest with cash prizes for our winners that will be um, kids. So if you come in here with a project that your mama did, it will be, uh, it will not be qualified for this, this <laughs> contest because I want the kids to really um, learn their, to really learn their history and not just for the purpose of learning it so that they can understand their history so that they can continue to move us forward um, as we need to move. So stay tuned. We'll be talking more about it um, in our next Monday Night Moms chat. Cool. I love it. All right, may the Lord watch no display. So we're gonna <laughs> play me and Z. I'm a church game. We're playing. Um, listen, I, I I don't have Black History Month stuff to share. I've got Disney on Ice, Family Night Out, Saturday the 22nd at Allstate Arena. Masked up, got to be vaccinated, but. I'm excited. As you guys know, one of the foundation events that we do for the for the Mom Squad are family night out events at Disney on Ice, Ringling Brothers, Jurassic, all that stuff. So Disney on Ice is back. It's only here now one time a year. Um, so next two weeks will be Disney on Ice and up Disney on Icing it up. The coupons will be at the elected official offices and it was also in the newsletter. So if you guys are not, we have been consistent with this newsletter. Thanks to Tony. Um, so if you guys are not getting the newsletter, there's a coupon in there for a $20 um, ticket. So that's my my wrap up and what we've got going on. And then we'll be back next week. So I'm very excited. Jarima, thank you 
Thank you. You all are amazing. I can't wait to next week and whatever we've got. And if you guys are interested in being a guest or if you guys have topics or ideas or thoughts that you yes. want, to, now is an amazing time to um, be sliding in my inbox. There's another mom. I'll keep her identity uh, secret, but we are working on a brunch. So she wants to do a, like a monthly brunch series. So I've got a whole nother mom doing all that stuff. So we've got some good stuff in store this year. So I'm excited. So thank you all for tuning in. Awesome. Just one question I want to address before we get up out of here. Somebody asked, um, how do you get the newsletter? The newsletter, I will post that again in the, I will post the, the link to um, how you get on the newsletter in the mom spot. So, so take a look out for that. And um, got we'll read, in. apparently. <laughs> around, here, around here, apparently we're supposed to read. <laughs> Imagine that. We go, she go get you, she go get you right these next three weeks. Hey, 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 right. hey that's that's all the way up. <laughs> all right, you all. Thanks so much, and we will be back with you again soon. Thank you.